my name is Andrew Kenny, and welcome to my series of short videos on the Apostles' Creed. So far, we have looked at the meaning of the phrases in the Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son. Having looked at the meaning of Jesus Christ, his only Son, let us look today, in the sixth video, at what it means to call Jesus Lord. The first Christian confession was, Jesus is Lord. There is great significance to this word. To be clear, by calling Jesus Lord, it does not merely mean that Jesus is Master, which of course he is, but it means much more. In the fellowship group I joined as a 15-year-old, one of the songs we sang virtually every week was, He is Lord, He is Lord, He is risen from the dead, and He is Lord. Every knee will bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In the English Old Testament, the name for God is usually translated Lord or Jehovah, being a rendering of the Hebrew word spelt Y-H-W-H, or Yahweh. When the Old Testament was translated into the Greek, the Septuagint, sometimes referred to as the Greek Old Testament or the translation of the 70, the Greek word karios was used to translate the holy name for God. In the New Testament, Jesus himself would also refer to God as Lord. In reply to a Pharisee who asked him which was the greatest commandment in the law, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, Matthew 22. However, a new development happened in that the word Lord, which was reserved for God alone, became the title for Jesus. Though the word Lord could be used for the lesser meaning equivalent to the title Sir, the New Testament, in the majority of cases, uses it to mean much more. The Lord Jesus could and did receive worship, which only was reserved for God. Paul also takes New Testament passages which are clearly referring to God and uses them in his letters in reference to Jesus. I remember when, over a period of weeks, I talked with a man who was thinking of becoming a Jehovah Witness. During that time, he gave me one of his magazines, which argued in it that Jesus was not God. I studied it, and to be honest, I had to pray hard and really think through what I truly believed, as well as what Scripture taught. However, after a week or so, my conviction was stronger than ever, that Jesus was truly God. One of the conclusions I came to was that if Jesus Christ was not God in flesh, the New Testament was actually blasphemous. The reason I came to this conclusion was that the New Testament exalts Jesus to a place reserved only for God. If Jesus Christ is not God and not to be worshipped, then the New Testament is wrong and must be rejected as heretical. Consider some of the passages in the New Testament. Throughout the New Testament, Jesus did many outstanding things that were not humanly possible. He did many miracles, such as giving sight to the blind, healing the lepers, the lame, and setting free those who were held captive by evil spirits. He defied nature by walking on the water, Calming the storm with a word, he fed the multitudes with a few loaves of bread and fish. He raised the dead. He was also able to speak peace into troubled people's souls. For example, he said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give you the peace that the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Some would say that these alone do not scripturally prove that Jesus was God in the flesh. As many spiritual men in scripture did miracles through God's power and ministered his grace to those who were oppressed. That is true. 
But there are passages that record Jesus forgiving sins, claiming to be Lord over the Sabbath, calling for men and women to follow after him, to love him more than their own father or mother or children, or even their own lives, to give up all and follow him. He also spoke of his father in such intimate terms. He fulfilled many prophecies written down hundreds of years before, which predicted his birth, his ministry, his being our sin bearer through the death and resurrection. He also received worship. After the woman saw the empty tomb where Jesus was led to rest, Matthew records, and they went to tell his disciples, Behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Did Jesus refuse worship, reserved only for God? No. Again, John records the story of Doubting Thomas. It says, A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Again Jesus received Thomas's worship and confession. If Jesus was not God, it was blasphemy on both Jesus's part and Thomas's. Thomas was in no doubt now. He believed that Jesus was his Lord and God. Paul, the great Jewish scholar who met the risen Christ on the Damascus Road, in his letters to the churches, uses Old Testament scripture, which clearly were God passages to refer to the Lord Jesus Christ. For example, Isaiah 45, it says, By myself I have sworn my mouth has uttered in all integrity a word that will not be revoked before me every knee will bow by me every tongue will swear. And Paul in Philippians writes, Therefore God has exalted him, Christ, to be the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The next witness is Stephen. He calls out to the Lord Jesus. In Joel 2.32 it reads, And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Psalm 31.5 says, Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. Acts 7.59 While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Another witness is a writer to the Hebrews who directly quotes Psalm 45 and Psalm 102. But about the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. Ye have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of gladness. He also says, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment they will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool? For your feet, after my time of soul searching, to repeat again, I became convinced that if Christ was not God, and you are worship, so much of the New Testament was truly blasphemous. Certainly this was the conclusion the Jewish leaders came to regarding Jesus. He had committed blasphemy with his words. John records in 518 this was why the jews were seeking all the more to kill him because not only was he breaking the sabbath but he was even calling god his 
own father, making himself equal with God. And again in John 10, 33, the Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. After telling the Jewish leaders that he and the Father are one, he said to them, Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy, because I said I am God's Son? Do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. My conclusion concurs with the Apostles' Creed. Jesus is God and he deserves our love, loyalty, obedience and worship. He invites us to come to him and find redemption, peace and reconciliation. He calls us, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. May you find peace in him today. God bless you. Bye-bye.